thinking about this this morning, Sebastian. So, um, you know, every time I chat with you, I think you're either 24 hours removed from being on a plane or 24 hours away from getting on a plane. <laughs> so we're going, so we're doing a family trip to New Zealand and Australia on Wednesday. We're flying with a five-year-old and, um, good luck. So we're getting a <laughs> yeah, I know exactly. Well, it was funny. I was telling the guys this morning. So we had, uh, it was our last, my little guy, it was his last weekend of hockey and it was recommended to us that from some friends were like, get some melatonin gummies. Um, and, and that'll knock them out. And then, um, uh, a girlfriend of my, my wife, she's a airline stewardess and she's like, Hey, you should try those out before the flight. Cause occasionally they can have the adverse effect and you might have a hyper kit on your hands. Yeah. So Saturday we have, we have a Sunday morning at seven 15 was our last ice time. All the parents were coming on the house and my little guy's all pumped. He's going to get to play goal. And, and then we gave him the half the melatonin gummy and that with the time, you know, rolling the clocks back, we, uh, he missed his, he missed his, uh, audition and goal. So, uh, <laughs> but I was thinking about you, what's like, you fly all the time. You must have like a zillion, like you must have so many pet peeves when it comes to flying, dealing with all I, the amateurs. Yeah, that yeah, not too bad. Uh, but to, to just get back to your story. When I played in Switzerland, uh, we tried this with, uh, with our son, we tried this with Thomas to give him some, some kind of a sleeping aid. And uh, like you said, it did the opposite effect. So really? Montreal, Zurich, the kid wide awake, middle of the night, you know, <laughs> so that was, that was not uh, a good trip, but uh, that's what it is, you know, traveling with kids. That's uh, it's part of the gig. So, uh, but uh, no, uh, yeah, <clears throat> traveling quite a bit. Um, this year I've been uh, spending almost like 20 to 22 days a month with the team. So it's, uh, wow. it's, it's a lot of fun. I'm, um, you know, uh, you know, my wife sometimes, uh, finds it a little bit hard, but it's part of a, she married a hockey player. So what do you expect? You know, <laughs> I'm still, I'm, I'm still in hockey and, uh, but we we're good. We have a long, long summer, so I make up for it when, and during the summer. So the season is busy, but, uh, that's the way I like it. Um, trying to stay connected with the team, connected with, uh, the players with everything that's going on, and then I, um, I get to come home, come home a little bit, and uh, then start all over all over again. So, so the role that you're in didn't exist when you were coming up. It, it, it's new, and I sense that you know team by team the role is structured very differently. Sometimes it's you know it's full time with the team. Sometimes it's in and out. Sometimes it's one coach managing all the you know teams right down to the East coast league. In some cases they might have a coach for each team. Um, how, how unique is, is perhaps the setup or maybe can you explain the setup and um, the expectations yeah. on you in, in Nashville? Well, um, basically like my role kind of started as well as player development with the team, taking care of the prospects and during COVID um, we had the taxi squad and uh, we were taking turns and who's going to take care of the taxi, uh, take care of the taxi squad. And, uh, I got to Nashville with, uh, with John Hines and, um, and, uh, he wanted me to take care of the taxi squad. And, uh, of course I'd be on the ice with the regular practice as well with the normal team. And, um, he really, he really enjoyed what I, what I would bring to the team, not only as, as far as, uh, game habit details, but also just in a normal, uh, tactical, uh, point of view, um, he valued my opinion quite a bit. We, we, we were talking a lot also with the, the other coaches, Dan Lambert, uh, Todd Richard and Danny, I know we, we had a, we had a really good group and, um, I was running the mix from day one, John Hines included me in everything. Yeah. He, uh, he was asking me my opinion. Um, funny story. Um, the, the first the first day I got there, I think for the taxi squad, we had a game day that that day, and uh, I, I mean I'm in there and I'm kind of on the side and quiet, minding my own thing. But I'm you know I'm listening, but I'm I don't want to create any fuss, so I'm uh, I'm kind of in the background. And uh, Einz is like, hey boards, uh, you know, once you go upstairs, come back in between periods, let me know what you see, and so on and so on. So I'm thinking to myself. He's being polite. He's trying to include me. You know, he's got so much going yeah. on. You know, he's being he's being nice. So, you know, I, I go upstairs and I do my thing. But I'm, you know, I'm I'm not looking at everything on a like a, like I would normally like I am now. But I'm kind of looking. But so 
I, I made a few notes on my uh, on my sheet, and I get down and like uh, so. We, everybody comes back in between period. Everybody's on his computer watching the replay or the PK replay, the power play, uh, whatever the, the OZP and different things. So he's taking notes. He's not even looking at me, you know. And hey, boys, what did you see? So I'm like, oh, I saw this and this and that, and uh, maybe we have to be careful on this. And it's like, so he doesn't even look at me, just taking his notes. I'm like, all right. So then I go, I go, keep doing my own thing. Then he goes in in between the after the period to talk to the team, and every little point that I pointed out to him. He just related to the, to the players. So I'm like, okay, so he's, he's really taking this seriously. <laughs> he's really he's really yeah. listening to my opinion. So I, I have to be dialed in now when I watch the period. So, you know, that's how he, that's how John was. That's how he included me in, in, um, in, in my role. So my job, my, my primary job was also to take care of every individual player's game habits. It could be Roman Yossi with, with his blue line work. It could be, uh, Philip Forsberg with his puck protection could be uh, Cole Smith with, uh, with his puck handling, different things, you know. So I would make notes during the game about players' individual things and also about what I, what I would see in the game as far as uh, tactical stuff. So it, And then we, we kind of stayed that way. So after the COVID year, John was like, uh, yes, I'd like to have you um, full-time if possible. I said, well, thank you very much, but... Uh, I can't come full time, but if you really want someone, I can help you find someone because uh, I need to come back to Montreal. My wife here, she got a, she's an OBGYN doctor. She's got yeah, her own practice. Yeah. She, she's got her own practice. She, she's busy. She followed me for 17 years with my career. Now it's a little bit of her, ter- her turn to kind of, you know, do her own thing. So I, I, it's not that I don't want to, I'd love to, but uh, you know, it's, it's part of what we decided as a, as a couple, so uh, I said, I'll help you find someone good. Uh, but then there's no, we, we want you. So I'm like, okay. So then we came up last year with a schedule of uh, being uh, somewhat like between eight to 11 days on, five, six days off and come, coming back and so on and so on. And um, when we had a coaches change, um, you know, Trotsy became the GM. I played for Trotsy. I played with Bruno, our coach. So it was just a matter. Of, okay, we know each other, but now can we work together? So it's been it's been pretty good so far. Um, I think my role stays the same. Uh, Bruno includes me in a lot of a lot of things. Uh, we have Todd Richard that's still there uh, with Danny, I know, and we have also now Derek McKenzie. So it's a, we have a, we form a good group um, this year again, and it's uh, it's a lot of fun. I my role is the same also with the, with the guys. I, I take care of the guys before practice. I'm on the ice for practice, and if the coaches need me for something else, I'm there. Then I stay on the ice after practice. Whoever wants some more stuff, uh, it's a lot of fun. And uh, I'm trying. I'm trying not to give too much video to the guys because there's lots going on, different meetings with the, with the team and stuff. But I, if I see something on the, on a player that I don't like, I'm gonna maybe show him one clip on my phone on the ice, and then we go and we do it on the ice directly. Uh, I don't. I don't spend a lot of time doing videos with them because. The other coaches do that. I don't. I don't want to um, do or too much video. So I'm doing. It's a, it's gonna be a few clips here, here and there on the ice about this is how you need to do this. This is how you need to do this. Look, you did it really well here. Uh, or if I see a player that's struggling on uh, wall plays or different things, I might take one uh, on really good player that's really good on wall plays. Uh, what makes him good? So then we try, try to work. Uh, on those things so it's uh, it's a lot of fun I, I it keeps me it keeps me on edge uh, looking at whatever's new who's doing good who's doing who could do better at different things um it's a lot of fun i enjoy it very much i, I want to go back to the story you told about john hines and you know i could see i just think there's a really good lesson here so i could see an example like you're you're new to the staff you know as a development coach like the other version of that story could have been, um, as you said, he's just being polite, doesn't really acknowledge your opinion, doesn't share it with the players, and you just become this wallflower in all of these coaches' meetings. And and listen, I I don't I, I wouldn't say that you know intentionally you might not be as invested, but we're all human beings, and I would think that there must be something to be said for because he did not only listen to your opinion, but he related to the players that, you know, the buy-in and the output he gets from you 
in addition to all the other coaching staff, that there's a lot to be said for that as just being a leader. And as you're operating a team that, you know, you don't want a, a staff of puck pushers because over 82 games, man, you're, you're going to, people are going to, they might not intentionally check out, but they might kind of check out a little bit. You know, Aaron, we all do this because we love it. We have a passion. And, you know, when, you, when you're joining a team like this, it's nice. You know, it doesn't matter if it's NHL, AHL, junior, wherever. Whatever group you join, you want to, be, you want to feel valued. And, and that's, for me, everywhere I've been, I've been really lucky. It was with the women's national team. It was with Montreal's farm team and Sylvain Lafayette and his, and, his, and his crew. Now it's with Nashville. Um, well, before, you know, being with the everyday team in Nashville, I was with our player development, uh, Scott Nichol, uh, Rob Scuderi. Uh, and yeah. we, we, we were ex- exchanging so much information, always talking, and you, you feel valued in, in your position, you know. And the same thing, like, you know, John included me right away. And then the, the coaches staff where it was great. They welcomed me as well. And they know, they know, like I'm, I have my position and I don't want to coach. I'm there to support them on whatever they need out of me. And it's, it's, it's good that way. And, and Bruno did the same thing. Derek did the same thing. So uh, at the same time, you know, you have to know where your, where your, where your, where your chair is. And then whenever they need you, you're, they need you, you're there. And um, that, that's, that's what I try to do, to do uh, the best way I can. And, and um, like you said, like John Hines uh, at the start valued me and included me in everything. Same as Bruno. And to me, that's a, that's a sign of, uh, of good coaches. They want to learn. They want to get better. They're asking for my opinion. Maybe my opinion is not always going to be the, 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 the right one or the best one, but they listen and they maybe they, they take 1% or they don't, they don't take 1%, but at least we, they, 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 they're asking for my opinion. And at the same time, it, uh, it starts a conversation. Oh yeah. Why do you see that? Why do you think of that? Like, why do you see this? You know, so on and so on. And that's to me, that's a sign of people that want to get better. That's a good sign of leadership. And, um, that, I think that's why, you know, look, look at this year, the, we're having a, a decent success. And, uh, you know, last year uh, I thought, you know, John, John Heinze did a pretty good job uh, with all the injuries that we had. We stayed in the mix a, yeah. a, a long time. So um, I think that that, that that tells a lot. Yeah, he had a hell of a call last night in OT too. Holy cow. <laughs> Holy boy, that was yeah. amazing. That yeah, was that he, uh, that's and the him. boys loved it. Like the boy, the post game interview, the boys loved it. Yeah, yeah. And no, he did. Um, you know, I, I think he, that's that's who he is. You know, he goes all in. You know, he's, he knows that the season's on the line. So why not? You know, you, I don't. You know, you get nothing to lose. So, so you know, you talk about just you know getting people's opinion. Um, so in your role, Roman Yossi has a bad game, and you got to go on the ice with him at practice. How do you approach that conversation? Is it, hey, Roman, this is what I've seen and we're going to work on this, this, and this? Or is it, hey, Roman, like, what did you see last night? Like, what do you, how do you sort of a, what kind of a dialogue do you have with the players and sort of peeling back the layers? We'll talk about Roman and we'll talk about the other guys. So Roman, I played with him when he was 16 years old and I was 34. I was playing with him in Bern. Are you serious? So, So the relationship with Roman is easy and I'm giving him to him when he plays like crap. So, uh, no, but, uh, no, uh, Roman is one of the first guys, you know, that, that's, that when I came in that wanted to work with me all the time. So it, you know, once the other guys saw that, okay, well, Roman is working with boards, you know, maybe, maybe he knows what he's talking about, you know, different things like this. So. No, uh, so that's how I kind of started the whole thing. But uh, um, th- I think the way you said it, like I'm going to go to the player because we all have so-so games and sometimes we we think we had a decent game or we thought we had a worse game than really what it was. So I, I start a conversation with him. It could be very easy just uh, around the coffee machine. Hey, uh, how did you feel last night? Like what would you see, you know? And then as, as he starts talking, then you can say, okay, hey, you did some really good things, but I felt like sometimes you were overcomplicated things. You know, like yeah. if, if your body, if the energy is not there, keep it simple and let, they, let the game come to you. You know, and it might be, it might, it might come. Sometimes we force things 
and we don't have the energy to, to back it up or so on and so on. So sure. then we start, we start talking about different things like this. And, uh, and a guy like Roman, sometimes you have, you have to be careful not to do too much because he plays 25, 26, sometimes 27 minutes a night. So on a day off, like, okay, what do you need out of me? Do you want to do anything? Do you want to do some blue line work, puck retrieval? What do you, what do you want to do? You know, things like that. So you kind of, you kind of let him know, uh, what you saw about the game and if he wants to work on different things. And sometimes it, it could be like three, four minutes only. And then it could be like, uh, uh, Okay, so the spin, uh, the spin work we did last year. Okay, yeah. at uh, the coaches' uh, site uh, convention conference, Roman stopped doing it for some reason. And Roman is like, "You're going down the wall, and you're just getting played. You're getting played, and then you you die in the corner. Why? Why are you stop doing it?" He's like, "I know. I, I don't know why. I, I, I f- I'm forgetting to do it at the at the right time. And sometimes when I." So, so then we had to talk about it and we just did a few times in practice just so it, it comes back to him and now it's back in his game. You know, little things like this. Sometimes it doesn't, you don't need to do it like 20 times, especially with guys like him. He knows that he's, he's able to recognize the situation and then, then we go on and we do it and then it comes back to his game. It could be, uh, it could be working with Phil, uh, Forsberg about, uh, not being too busy with the puck and sometimes, you know, you're like, hey, Phil. In the red zone near the net, calm down with the puck. Like just make sure you load and shoot, load and shoot, and protect it, and you know get get ready for that release. Things like this, and you like, and because just an example. I remember that one summer I was working with, uh, <clears throat> I was skating the the guys from Montreal in August, getting ready for uh, the season, and I spend, uh, you know, we do. Uh, I don't know, 20 minutes of practice. Then the guys would play a scrimmage and sometimes the guys would stay on, would do some shooting, do different things. And then Shea Weber stayed on the ice with me and he wanted to take some shots. So I gave him like 10, 10 passes. It like just stop, slap shot, stop, slap shot. After five or six on the A Shea, I'm sure you know, but did you realize you took nine shots with your head down? He's like, oh, I know. In the summer, I forget. I had developed my bad habits, you know. But now, like, right away, as soon as I told him, he was able to switch it up. The next 10 shots he took, his head, his head was high, and every shot was on net. You know, but sometimes we 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 forget our our to our good habits. And uh, I remember my I had a Russian coach in uh, Switzerland, an assistant coach, and we were taking shots after practice. And then he, he threw his stick in the stand. He's like, Mamma Mia, boards. You, you took every shot with your head down. I'm like, no. And then there was someone filming me at the same time and, he, and with the phone. And he showed it to me. I'm like, oh, my God. I couldn't believe it. I, I really thought I was looking at the net. But I, I was not looking at the net. I was looking at the net as I was shooting, not before. So little things like this that sometimes we forget as player that I'm trying to remind them. Little details left and right. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I do. I look at those details and uh and I enjoy it. <laughs> so. it. It's funny. Like, I, I think that's, um, well, one, um, I think we can all acknowledge that uh, I'm sure the Russian coach in Switzerland was awesome, but let's maybe yes. take the approach of <laughs> HJ. You probably already know this, but your head's down versus the stick in the, in the, in the yeah. bleachers. Um, but I, I would just, you know what? I, I would think that part of the, um, the secret sauce, if you will, of what you do is is how you approach those conversations because i mean let's face it these these players are they're well compensated they're in that league for a reason um they've clearly paid attention to you know uh fine tuning their own skill set and um you know i i could just see where that approach of saying hey you pro- you may already know this but just gentle reminder that your head's down and then that kind of maybe opens the door and builds some trust how much of your job do you think, Sebastian, is is almost like a golf pro where it's not about, you know, recalibrating the entire engine. It might just be like, hey, you just need to follow through a little more. Or just find those where those little, you got to move the dial one degree versus trying to, you know, reinvent it. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot because, you know, they're in the NHL. They've been, they've been playing hockey for the longest time. I'm not, I'm not going to change them from A to Z like – with the little practice that we have during the hockey season, so it's it's to tweak, it's to tweak left and right uh, some of the, some of their details of their game. Um, 
at the end of last season, uh, unfortunately, well, unfortunately for our team, but Roman and Phil had a concussion. So yeah. for the last month and a half, last month or two months, I, I was on the ice with them managing their workload, but we, we did under control skills, like all those, those refined skills, like, you know, like soft catch shooting, soft catch passing back in the forehand, uh, different things. Um, so you can take the time and teach and this, but, but I agree with you. It's, it, you can't change them hundred percent. And you, like you said, the relationship, basically I'm trying, I'm trying to be what I wish I had when I played, you know? So, yeah. so you, you're, you need their, their trust because they're listening to you and, and for their game, you know? And so, as you know, maybe our average team skills could be a seven because, you know, you take everybody individually and you rate them or whatever. But if I, if I can bring everybody 0.5 up, then our team skills is going up. And then we can, then yeah, I yeah. can, then I, then we can work our skating and puck skills according to Bruno's system, you know, things like this. So that's what I'm trying to, to do in the everyday little practice that we have. But, uh, I'm very fortunate that the, the, the guys are so receptive. They, you know, they, they come to me, they're asking questions and, uh, it makes it makes my job very easy, and uh, also with Danny, I know we he spends a lot of time with me on uh, with different guys. Uh, it, it's been fun. It's been fun. I, you know what? I think what you just laid out there is a great framework for a lot of our listeners in the sense of saying, "Hey, like if you can just focus on making every player 05 percent better versus spending all your time on the breakout, like over the course of a season, you're probably going to see, um, you know." much more gains in terms of your overall team play. You know, Sebastian, you mentioned video earlier and bringing your phone onto the ice and just showing, you know, a player one clip and then jumping right in and, and, and working on that skill or tactic, you know, just as you said that I'm like, man, like I'm sure if, if I'm an NHL player, the last thing I want to do is sit in front of a projector screen and watch more video. Like I'm sure they just get inundated now and it's available to them 24 seven on the plane, iPads, et cetera. Mm -hmm. How, how important is it to maybe look at how we're feeding players information? It doesn't have to be a five minute presentation. It doesn't have to be in a formal setting. It can be just on a phone. It can be, you know, just a, a quick hit and, and maybe it's better to try and get one thing to sink in versus trying to get five things to sink in that might go in one ear and out the other. I think everybody's got his own way of doing things. I'm more hands on. I like to show it. I'm, I'm still able to be on the ice and show them exactly what I want, you know, with, uh, with, with, the, with the skills I want to show. It could be a skating, it could be a shooting. So I'm, I'm, up to date on my on my own skills, so I'm able to teach them the right way. And you know, unless it's really, really a bad movement or a bad thing that they're doing, uh, I'm not going to spend that a lot of time on a video. I'd rather them to see it yeah. on the ice. You know, where in our in our environment that we can teach and feel, and so we can talk about it. If I say something and they don't like it. And like, okay, why? Okay, uh, the position your hands, maybe maybe your feet, and this and that. So, because you you can spend all day on the video, but un until they try it themselves, then you can't really talk yeah. about it. You know, they're they're gonna be yeah, yeah, it looks good. Yeah, I'll try it, and this and that. Uh, just a good example. Igor of Afanasyev, one of our guys, he was playing in Windsor, and I've, he had a lot of glide in his game. Like on the four check, you know, he, like he would all be, all, he'd be, keep his feet on the ice and would glide and he would not, he would not be able to be efficient on the four check. And I, and uh, Igor, his English was pretty good. He understood everything. But until I went on the ice and I showed him exactly how I wanted him to four check, he, he, he couldn't re register it, you know? So yeah. it was a little thing. And, uh, Trevor Latowski, the, the assistant coach in Montreal, was his head coach at the time. He was like, hey, Borch, come on the ice and spend time with Igor. And just the little things like this. It was not it was not like crazy scientific or whatever. Igor, just go sure. there, good stick, move your feet all the way to the goal line. And then after the goal line, you can steer one way or the other, see what's going on, you know. And he didn't he didn't realize. He thought he was skating, but he was just gliding. Yeah. So, so little things like this that I – 
to me and I like to them to, to, to feel and see on the ice. Uh, um, that's just how I do things. And um, I've been, even in the summer with my guys, I'm all alone on the ice. So I don't have any, I can't just film and and watch them and correct them as they go. So I, I sometimes I do have a stationary iPad for, for, for something, but most of the time it's just me and myself and I'm correcting them as they as they go. So, uh, but there's, you know, there's different ways of doing things, but that's how I like to do it. Um, you, you know, you mentioned, so, you, I mean, we talk about the four check in this case, you mentioned you're, you're responsible for game habits. Can you maybe give an example of, and, and I don't know if what you just touched on, um, with Igor is, is a game habit, but a game habit versus a skill versus a tactic, et cetera, and how that gets defined. Or if I'm going to look at um, the way, let's say, like I spent a lot of time. So Michael McCarron has been with uh, with me almost 10 years now because I had him in Montreal and he came to Nashville and I've uh, been working with him quite a bit. And uh, it's funny because <laughs> it took a long time, but now it, there's a few things that he does that I was, I was, I've been teaching him since he was with Montreal. And now in his game, it's, it's so efficient that, it, that, he, that, he, that he, every time he's on the wall and he's getting pressure, I want to say four to five times he comes out with a puck. Puck protections, like, like I've showed at the coaches' conference, the puck protection on his back end, on going to yeah. his back end and spinning him back on his forehand. He does that all the time. So those are little game habits that I'm going to like – Show guys like this is why you lose a puck here. Like your your puck is exposed, or it could be uh, a net front position for you know. And you have one guy going in the zone wide, and he does a delay. Usually, you have two keeps going, and he is and he stops at the net. Now, where you stop at the net is is the key. Are you on the right side of the defenseman on the left side? Are you able to go to the to the if the if your F one cycles it down? Are you going to be able to? to shield the, def- the defenseman with your body or you're just going to be net front to be net front? Little things like this that I'm looking uh, or, or ozone entry, like are they able to gain the middle and then create the demon to, to get close together to, to be able to kick it wide? Like little things like this, uh, especially for the forwards uh, that, that, that we do according to uh, Bruno's system. And for the defenseman, it could be a puck retrieval on the rim uh, how they attack the rim, not, don't wait for the rim. How do you attack it and what's next after that, you know? Um, so things like this that, that, that I try to, that I try to watch and facilitate their game in, in tough situation where, uh, like kind of not tough, but like awkward situation that we can generate more, uh, puck plays to, to have like a continuous chain of events. That's the, that's the, yeah, that, that's so interesting because I think so much of, um, coaching is, is trying to replicate a very controlled environment where, I mean, as we know in our sport, very, very little is controlled. And I, I, I just, at the time that we're recording this, the, um, the Oscars were last night. Have you seen the movie Oppenheimer? Not yet. Not yet. I just missed it. My wife, we watched it yesterday. She told me it was okay. really good. So I have to watch it. Yeah. Well, there's this there's this great scene in the movie where um, uh, Niels Bohr, who's a uh, uh, like a world renowned physicist, who's kind of uh, mentoring a young Robert Oppenheimer, and they're kind of at the blackboard and they're trying to figure out this equation. And he goes, he goes, Robert, he goes, do you feel the music? And Robert's like, what are you talking about? It's math. He's like, no, do you feel the music? And he's like, he's like you can't, he's like, if you're just going to solve the problem or follow like the step by step, like anybody can do that. Can you feel it? Can you feel like yeah. the impact this is going to have on the, on the world? Very different context of it. Like no, 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 but I, I, I understand their correlation. Yeah. But I can see like where so much of like, that would be kind of the, the crux or evolution of your role is to say, Hey, can you not just, you're not trying to get players to say, Hey, when you get up to the pylon turn left, it's like, Hey, here's an environment and you got to, put the Rubik's cube back together, um, in, in real time. And as we know, and I'll, I'll tell you what, like one of the biggest influences on, on me, um, as, as a coach was when I coached at UBC, we used to get a lot of the visiting teams come through and practice. And so of course you bring up your, um, yeah, you steal the drill. So you go up top yeah. and you watch, 
But then one day I, I watched from the glass at ice level and it's like, holy shit, like this is like so fast and so intense. Like, you know, again, just these sort of static sort of control drills, this probably isn't doing anybody a service if this is the league they're trying to get into. No, it's uh, the thing that's the hardest in hockey, I think, is to develop instinct. You know, like you said, because yeah. you can put you can put pylons and sticks and all kinds of stuff on the ice. And it's, uh, you know, you can never re- replicate in a game. A game, there's there's too much going on and it's, it's, it's never the same pattern. So to me, if we're talking you know, to our, to our, our coaches uh, that are listening, you know, at, at a very young age, you want to develop skating and puck skills, okay? Because the game is slow. The ice is big. There's there's lots of room out there, and if if the kid is is a good skater and a good puck handler with his with his, with his uh, when he's able to have his uh, head up at a slow pace, that's where the hockey IQ starts. That's where he starts to register hockey IQ. Okay, and then and then as he as he matures, as he gets older, the game it gets faster. The player get the, the 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 players are getting bigger. There's less time and space on the ice. And if if he's if his hockey IQ is starting to develop at a young age, then he still keeps it up. Where if the other guy is still struggling with his skating or his puck handling, also worried about getting hit. And okay, yeah. where where are my guys? And he's he's still looking down, trying to figure out his puck handling, skating, whatever. That's where you, the separation with the guys that have good instinct, good hockey IQ is, uh, is becomes major. So, and then as you, as you get older, it's not everybody that can, you know, develop at the same, at the same rate, but within, within your team, if you play those small area games and you let, let them figure it out, that's how you're going to have a good team with good instincts. I think, um, according to the concept of what the coaches want. So that's, that's a little bit, uh, what I see. So, um, I, I know you, you don't practice a whole bunch and I'm sure this time of the year, it's, it's even less than you normally would, but you talk about small area games and it's funny, like 10 years ago, a small area game was three on three cross ice. And, um, you know, you might include uh, pass to a coach to make it dynamic now. I mean, we see this every day. I mean, it amazes me the creativity that coaches have come up with and sort of designing these games, you know, not just as the thing you do at the end of practice to make it fun, but as, as, as a teaching environment. So two questions. One, how often would a small area game be introduced into a Nashville Predators practice? And, and two, can you give any examples of ones that you think are um, might play well with, you know, youth coaches in particular? Uh, every day, Aaron. Every day we do small really? area games. Every day, yeah. And uh, even if it's just a cycle drill that we're gonna do, we might put some pressure on them. Uh, we want them to figure out uh, the pressure, figure out the sticks. So yeah, it's it's almost every day that we're doing it. When we have like a normal practice, uh, I'm not talking a morning skate or. Yeah. Uh, but uh, as much as possible, we we try to incorporate. Uh, um, decision making under pressure uh, because that we, we think that's the game uh, a good job that uh, that we do is uh, we're inside the blue line we have three against three uh, you go offense defense and out and then it just it just rolls sometimes we start practice with this it, it just kind of creates some good energy some good momentum and uh and then at the end of practice, sometimes what we do, we're going to do like a two, two against two, uh, almost like in the net would be on uh, one dot uh, facing the, the, the corner. And the, there's two against two, like in the corner. So it's really tight. There's, you know, big bodies in the NHL and then you have to figure it out and puck protection and good stick. So there's different things like this that, that we do on a regular basis that, uh, it just, I think we, first of all, it, it develops your instinct and it uh, develops your compete level because, you know, in the NHL, they're all like super competitive and uh, nobody wants to lose and skate at the end or, or whatever the consequence is. Um, so it's, uh, that that's how uh, Bruno likes it and it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. 
Do you remember where you were in 1993 when you were selected by your hometown Montreal Canadiens? Well, I was in Quebec. I was at the, I was at the draft in Quebec City. <laughs> okay. Please tell me you had a hot dog there because they had the best hot dogs in the world at the old Coliseum. I probably I probably did because uh, I love hot dogs. But um, yeah. uh, you know, it's those. It's like my first game in the NHL. The draft, the your first NHL game. It's like you don't. Not that you don't remember it, but it's like you're so nervous. You just. You just you know trying to go through the day and uh, it's it's emotional. Uh, so it's uh, l- when you look back after now the memories are coming back. But at the time and you you you're, you're a little bit overwhelmed with uh, with everything. Uh, but it's uh, it was good. It was uh, it was a good day for uh, my dad. My dad was sitting at a table because he was a uh, assistant coach with uh, he was a head coach of the of our HL team. So he didn't know. He had no clue. Andre really? uh, Andre Boudreau was his, uh, so so my dad played with Andre in Vancouver for the Canucks back in the day, and um, Andre would I don't know if, I don't know why but he would call my dad Joe. Hey Joe, you ready? My dad was like, "What are you talking about? Just stay ready, Joe." And then Serge Savard uh, went on a microphone and just called my name for the, for the draft, and my dad like started to cry and everything. So I was sitting with my okay. mom in the stands. So it was, it was good. It was a good moment. It was fun. <laughs> oh man, I bet, I bet. Um, what what advice? Just growing up, and I mean, just some parallels here. Obviously, you know, your son Thomas is an incredibly talented young man, and is just. Uh, you know, beginning his NHL career, but you know, what advice would have your dad given you say on the car ride home that still plays well today, whether it's to your own son or just to, you know, any parent that's uh, bringing, you know, has an ambitious kid who wants listen, to be Listen to your coach. Listen yeah, to your coach. Yeah. Do what he wants. He's, he's the one putting you on the ice. Do what he wants. That's, that's the number one thing that he always said. So if you don't, he's like, so sometimes I would call him. He's like, did you, did you do what he wanted? I'm like, I'm pretty sure I did. No, because otherwise you would have played. So listen to what he says, what he wants. He's the one. He's the one putting you out there. But you know, obviously, you want to play your game within the coach's game. You know, whatever he wants. You know, if so, so if you're, uh, if you're um, just like a typical dump and chase kind of guy uh and he wants you to maybe you know work on on your shot because he needs a little bit more out of you on the offensive part you know like don't just get rid of the puck hold on to it hold on to it a little bit more like do some cutbacks re-attack the net things like that or if you're a more skilled player and he wants you to play a little bit more direct do what he wants and if, when then when the time comes, do your do your do your skill stuff. You know, use your vision, use your uh, your shot or different things, uh, your fakes to, to, to be dangerous. So, um, like everything, it's 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 a balance. Um, you know, you want to the coach. The coach is the one putting you out there. Is the one uh, making the decision. So that's that's how it's got to be. So Thomas, when you look at you know, the work that you do today and the work that you've done in sort of uh, mentoring Nashville's prospects uh, on, on their path to the NHL. Um, and then you look back at your own sort of onboarding to being a professional hockey player, you know, A, like how different is it today? And um, what what's maybe, I mean, it's, it's great to say that there's a, a coach in your role, but what's really the, maybe the underlying value that um, that benefits a player just to have somebody within the organization that's kind of looking out for them. That's not going to, you know, they're not giving them their contract. They're just, they're just there to help. You know, uh, I'm trying to be, especially when I was like taking care of the prospects, I'm trying to be like a big brother. Like it, it's not easy to make it to the NHL. It's not like every, even if you're playing junior and you're a top prospect, there's there's everyday life. There's whatever your, your parents, your agent. There's there's lots going on, and um, there's a lot of things that I've been through as a player that I'm trying to guide them um, with my experience. So um, that's 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 what I try to do. Like, there's not a whole lot that uh, that I haven't uh, went through. 
So I'm trying to guide them. Obviously, they need to, to live their own experience, but that, uh, if you can prep them, that, that's a, a step forward, I think. I did want to ask you, so, and, and, and you can clarify this, you weren't selected by Nashville in the expansion draft, but you were traded in the summer prior to, to year one. Is that correct? Yeah, I was traded at the draft uh, right after the expansion draft. I believe they took Thomas Volkun out of Montreal. So Yes. And the trade uh, that happened with me was probably against uh, a case of pucks or something. I'm not even sure. <laughs> Future considerations. Uh, but uh, Those were good pucks, yeah. though. Those were good pucks. Yeah. About. Nonetheless, I ended up here and uh, it turned out okay. So. <laughs> So I mean, we we all I think hockey fans today we we think of Nashville and and every you know Smashville what that's become and it seems like you know as good a hockey town as, as any. But if we rewind the clock a little bit, I mean, you're going from not arguably like the most historic hockey franchise in the world, a place where they live and breathe it. What was your first impressions of going to Nashville? Um. It was actually really good. The uh, people here, uh, not only in the organization, but people around the city, like we were the first pro team in Nashville. Like the, the Titans weren't even here. They were still in Houston. Oh, that's right. Okay. Uh, so we were the first pro team um, in, in town. So everybody welcomed us uh, with open arms. And um, it was amazing. Uh, you know, the uh, country music scene and the music industry, like they, they all wanted to be part of that of that scene. And, so we we got invited everywhere, and you know we were a bunch of plugs that nobody wanted. And we all came together here in Nashville, and and uh, we had a really good group with uh, Tom Fitzgerald as our captain, um, you know David Poyle and Barry Trotz. So they they're really really good human and try to bring a good vibe and a good culture, and that's that's what that's what happened. And um, it was I think it was a a good foundation, a good start for for what we see or what we've seen in the past year, and we still. You know, with Barry here coming back as a GM and just like full circles, uh, so it's a, uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I feel very fortunate that I was part of that, um, that you know, that first team in '98. And uh, even though it was it was it wasn't easy every night because we had to fight. You know, like hockey in the South was uh, was fa- fairly new, and I don't think a lot of teams back then took us very seriously. But uh, we still put up good fights. Is it fair to say that Nashville full on hockey town now? I would say so. I mean, it's it, you know, if you look at just the, the last few games we played here, people got excited. You know, it's it's getting you know nice and hot here. I put a nice little weather like playoff hockey, and then, you know, we can feel that, that the fans were really excited to get back in the playoffs. So I could say it's a, I would say it's a, one of the really good hockey town in the, in the market. You know, you, you talk about that culture, you know, again, this is from an outsider's perspective, but it, it would appear to me that the, the culture that exists in Nashville today, like that can very much be linked back to that inaugural season. Like it seemed like there's very much a, an identity that stuck with the predators in terms of the hard work, the, the grittiness and that sort of blue collar mentality. You know, you, you talk about, um, you know, David Poyle and Barry Trotz just being really good people. Um, you know, I, I've never met David Poyle. We've been super fortunate to work with with Barry on a couple of occasions. And a, again, just through my experience, I'm like, man, it, it would be really tough to hang out with that guy day in and day out and, and not just try and live your best life and do things to the best of your ability. Is, is there something to be said of just when you talk about culture building, just, you know, setting an example and being a really good dude? Well, you know, from the from the get go, you know, it all it all started with with David, and then it trickled down with 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 Trotsky and and then the rest of the coaching staff, and then the, the players. Um, you know, like I said, I said in a funny way that we were a bunch of plugs, but it's really what it, what it was. Like we were players struggling to make it in the NHL, and then we ended up in Nashville, and everybody had something to prove. So. You know, we all we all came together, and we all wanted to, to show uh, everyone that okay, we belong in the NHL, and we're going to prove it. We're going to play hard, and you know, we're going to put up a good fight, and, and and that's what we did. And I think you know, Trotsky had been in the minors for a long long time. 
he wanted to prove himself as a coach as well. So yeah, everybody had something to prove and to gain. So we we, we were on the same boat and we were trying to pull um, pull it together. And I think that's what we did. And I I think that it set, set up a good foundation for for the rest. And over the years, you know, I, I left after uh, three and a half years, and it, it kind of stayed. It kind of stayed with David and 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 Barry. And Barry was there for a long time. So. Uh, he was able to 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 to, to put his uh, a really really good uh, footprint on on um, on what he wanted, and he became, I think he, over the years, of course, he became a better co a better coach with more experience, more knowledge, and um, yeah, that's why that's why he you know eventually ended up winning a Stanley Cup, you know, and it would have been nice for for Nashville for him to do that here, but uh, you know, there's still uh, he, he came back, and maybe we'll, we'll do that with him. Uh, another way still a chance still a chance no i it, i yeah i'll tell you what that, that'd be a heck of a parade to 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 take part in if that you guys can uh, make it happen down there during your time in nashville um you know my impression is you you developed i mean you, you had some great numbers offensively but you also um developed a role as a as a high-end penalty killer um is yeah. that something you had always done in your career or was that something that you kind of had to develop that, those tools so you could, you know, fill that role and, and, and maybe, because I mean, you were such an offensive guy through junior hockey. Um, was, was that sort of a, um, a well, a just, to, just to go back a little bit in Montreal, you know, I get drafted in Montreal in 93, uh, the year they, the last year they won the cup. Uh, and then I played my next two seasons in junior. I came, I came back, uh, I came to Montreal as a 20 year old. And then, you know, in Montreal, there's a lot of traffic down the middle. You had uh, Vinny Danfous, Pierre Turgeon, and uh, Sarko Koivu. So, you know, all right, yeah. uh, it, it, where am I going to fit with that team if I want to stay in Montreal? So I have to, I had to become a little bit better defensively. And, you know, I was always good on faceoffs, but I wanted to be the best. Uh, now, okay, what's the next step? Okay, I'd be good maybe on the PK yeah. because if there's no room in a power play, then can I play the other special uh, special unit? So I wanted to be on the PK, and you know I was I was always uh, always was a good skater, and um, and then I people were like doing this, some some uh, comparable with me and Guy Carboneau, and Guy Carboneau was really good defensively, really good on the PK. So I'm like, all right, let's let's try to be good on the PK. So I um, I've, I've learned to to have good stick and good anticipation on, uh, on, on reading plays. And, and one of the main thing also to be a good PK guy, you need to block shots. You know, you need to not be afraid of getting in front of pucks and paying the price. And then sometimes, sometimes you sit in front of, uh, of the shot and it's how McKinnis winding up and you still got to eat it. So that's, that's part of the gig, you know? And, uh, um, so yeah, you have to develop uh, new new tools uh, for you to, to to be able to be on the ice. And uh, when I so when I came to Nashville, uh, um, you know they had obviously David and uh, Trotsy had scouted me in Montreal, and I had that kind of a, a little bit of that role of a PK guy, uh, you know, good five on five. So I, I followed up on the, in that position, and we had uh, some some really good offensive uh, players playing. Uh, on a par play, so I had to find my way again to to make to, to gain some ice time, and then and, and that's what I did. You know, every time we kind of became me, Scott Walker, and Ville Pelton, and we kind of became the checking line. But we were also like three really good skaters, three really good uh, guys that could you know play good with the puck and create offensively. So you know, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, both of us finished with forty points. Uh, and not not our own line finished with uh, 40 points each, and maybe Pelton in a little bit more. So, uh, you know, as as a checking line, you have 120 points, uh, at 16 goals, 24 assists. Scotty Walker had I'm not sure exactly what was his goal and assist, but you know, as as far as like being a checking line and being able to provide some offensive as well, I think that's what made made us uh, dangerous because we were the three of us were really good skaters and we were feeding off each other. And me and Walks were killing penalties and blocking shots and. Every time we had a chance, we'd go on offense, even on the PK, because you know, with our skating ability. So um, it was a no, it was a, it was a lot of fun, and you know, like I, like I said, you, the NHL is the best league in the world, and sometimes you have to change your role to to get in and to 
find some ice time and and then after that you know eventually if you have a chance to play on offense and try something else but i mean you have to find a way to get in and you know once you're in you never know after that it is i i, I can just given that personal story like i would have you relayed that? I, I would think to so many of the players you've worked with, because I would it be fair to say that if you you take away the McDavid's and the Drysidles and the Crosby's and those players, that everybody else, you know, being a regular in the National Hockey League is just what you described. Are you are you adaptable enough to to find ice time and and find different ways to bring value? I, I yeah, I, I try to relate that message every day to to to, to the young guys. Well. Here now in the NHL, I'm spending most of my time with the, with uh, with the press. But when I was going to Milwaukee or even like seeing our prospects uh, uh, in, in the past, I'm like, like what's gonna separate you from the other guys once you turn pro? You know, like what's because there's a lot of guys, there's a lot of really really good players that are playing in the American Hockey League or playing in Europe that have tried to make it in the NHL, but they they don't want to change their game. Either they're stubborn or they don't want to or they they can't do it. You know, so it, it's you know, it's what are you going to do to crack the NHL? And and sometimes it's uh, a willingness or sometimes it's it could be a skill. It could be a skating skill. It could be a... Um, Standing in front of Al McKinnis' shot. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, whatever it is, you know, sometimes you have to adapt, like you said, and and being, uh, being humble enough and open-minded to, okay, uh, I'll... Always been an offensive player. I've always been good. I've been scoring goals all my life, but now I have to find another role to, to be able to crack the lineup. Because uh, maybe you know the the team drafted you, but the coach at the time wasn't there. That's not the same culture. So now you're in the NHL with a different coach, a different mentality. What are you gonna do to find your way in with that coach? You know, uh, it could be, oh, okay, I need to be more physical. I need to block more shots. I need to win more faceoffs. So whatever would that, would, it would be, that's 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 the guys that, that, that can figure that out quick, uh, make that make it. So it's it's so, not easy, but it's uh, that's that's how it is. Yeah. Well, no, I listen. I I can I can. I mean, I I get so much feedback from these conversations. I can guarantee, um, this that last answer is going to get relayed by like every junior coach to every one of their players. So that's, that's invaluable. Um, we know from our analytics, like at the coaches site that uh, penalty kill and penalty killing skills is one of the most searched terms um, from our community. And I think it's one of those areas, like we all recognize it's goes without saying how important it is in terms of winning hockey games. But in terms of like, if you ask somebody like how to improve their shot, like most coaches would have some drills to work on shooting or passing or any of those skills. Penalty killing, um, not so much. If, if a player came to you and said, you know, hey, Coach Bortolo, I want to turn myself into a penalty killer. What kind of drills or what might you do with them in practice to help them develop those skills as an individual? Well, learning to to learning to cut seam with your stick, you know, like. Uh if you put two or three guys uh, around the circle and you have one guy in the middle and you try to, and the guys are trying to pass it through your stick, you know, and I'm just passing it around, but they're passing through your stick and trying to try to cut lanes. And uh, it could be, it could be in the air. It could be on the ice. And, you know, as, as sometimes as a forward, we we're not used like, like these to, to cut that triangle. Sometimes our triangle, uh, when you know, we, we extend our, our arm in front of us, Sometimes yeah. we're not used to, 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 to the angle of, of cutting passes and stuff like this, which are, these are, they learn at a young age to, when the, when the puck's on the right side, they're going to move their stick a certain way. And on the, on the other side, the same thing. So you can, you can work on that skill uh, in practice a little bit. It's a little, it's a little bit standing still, but still it really, it helps you. Um, it helps you to, to, to develop that instinct of, of cutting passes and reading it, reading the stick a little bit. Uh, also, now it's we're fortunate we have some really really good rubber pucks that you can shoot. Uh, you know, before it was only like foam pucks that you can't really shoot those, but now we have some really good rubber pucks that are, uh, you know, that you can practice blocking shots. Uh, and I know it's I know it's not fun, but you still have to learn to do it. You know, because uh, sometimes we, we you know, the perception of of uh, of what we see and what the puck sees is different. 
so to, 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 to teach that uh, it's a skill as well and uh, um, there's different ways you can teach that and sometimes you it's it's not that easy and not everybody has access to that but you can put a rope you know uh, tying to the net so you put a rope to the net and then you put a rope uh, in a long rope that the D um, as the rope according to it could be attached to him or like connected to, to, to the same line that yeah, he yeah. has but, so the, the basically the line we don't want to be lined up with the player we have to learn to be lined up with the puck and that's what sometimes the, the issue is is that sometimes guys are lined up to the, with the player and the puck is always um available the the, the 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 shooting lane is always available and well now it's 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 even tougher because we're teaching all our d's to change the angle at the last second so you know, as a forward, you go going to the puck, but they, they're changing the, the angle. So you have to be able to adapt and react. And it's a skill. It's a skill. Blocking shots and in today's NHL, it's a skill. And uh, the teams that do it really well have success on the PK and they help the goalie because, you know, as we know, yeah. our your best PK guy is your goalie, but uh, you can also help him by blocking shots. Uh, and especially in today's NHL, I want to say 90% of the team, they play a diamond. Uh, so there's a lot of shot that, that you know that needs to be blocked by by the defenseman and also the the, the forward on top. So it's uh, it's uh, when you play in the PK and in today's NHL you need to pay the price. And if you're willing to do that, then you know and you you have good stick work and uh, and um, you know good skating ability, but also um, yeah you need to have some instinct. So it's uh, you need to practice on reading the play knowing who you're against, who you're against out there you know as we know like you know when ov is on the on that on that flank he's oh, i would not want to be i wouldn't want to you know, yeah him, well no. you know he's we know he's there so we we have, we have to stay tight yeah. to him but then at the same time you don't want to open up everything else we know that you know kucherov is on the half wall we have the, with Braden point in the middle and then stamp goes in the back so you know you got to know who you're against and you know trying to cut some of the plays, but, you know, these guys are so good. That's, you know, I think most of the PKs are, are going to be good under control, but once there's a scramble, that's where the, those top guys find find the lanes and it's tough to defend. Yeah. And that's that's when your goalie comes in or or you sometimes it's tough. But, uh, yeah, that's uh, being a PK guy in the NHL today is a, is a hard job. Um, your son Thomas played in Michigan. I'm not sure if you had a chance to watch any of their their games um, in the playoffs and in, in the tournament and, and leading up to the Frozen Four, but um, Frank Nazar, I don't know if there's a kid that's um, hated a backhand pass more than him, but he makes this unbelievable between the legs pass on a two on one, and, I, and you know, and I and I bring. Have you seen the play? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, you know, I would say it's probably like five years ago. We saw some players, you know doing it on a breakaway and then it was like off rebounds. And I used to think like, you know, it's hot dog and or nobody, but like it, it's happened enough times now. And I saw that, you know, I saw that play. I'm like, man, are we, are we at a point now where we're doing our kids a disservice if we're not teaching them? And I, and I'm not the person, I mean, to no, demo that. Like, are we doing, you're not like, like how much yeah. of this part of the game should we be acknowledging is, is a part of the game and kids probably need these tools moving forward. Well, there's, 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 Two mentalities. There's people are going to say, "Well, that's too cute or too fancy for no reason." What are the odds of uh, of this happening again? Or you know, you know. I think you need to have it in your toolbox, but knowing when to use it. You know, if it, in this situation you use it because you wanted to change the angle of the pass, and it worked. That's good. It might not work every time, but it worked in, the, in that situation. Now we see it sometimes. For the fours that are um, on a power play that are um, net front, you know, sometimes they just want to change the angle quick in front of the goalie, you know, be when they want to pop in the middle. Um, I think it's a it's it, it's a good tool to have in your toolbox, but at the same time, knowing when to use it. So, in a lot of a lot of the skills that's being taught out there, everything I think is really good. But the main thing with all of this is, can you teach your kids or your players? to use those tools at the right time. And that's where I think sometimes there's a bit of a separation because, you know, it's super nice. We have access to a lot of things on social media, on YouTube, on different things, For and sure. it's great. But knowing to use 
your skinning ability or your puck skills ability at the right time, it's another thing. So, um, yeah, the more the merrier, but, you know, you don't want to be on the ice and do fancy stuff that are useless when you have nobody on you. Right? In this situation, it was perfect. You changed the angle last second. It went across. I think it was great play. Uh, but sometimes you see guys doing things for no reason, like where you, did, you could have just made a normal play. Yeah. The same thing with saucer pass. Like sometimes you see kids make, doing making a saucer pass for no reason. Like just just send them a good crisp pass, tape to tape. You don't need to make a saucer pass there. Like there's enough time on the ice where you can make a saucer pass. If you don't have to, don't make one. You know yeah. things like that. You know. Um, so, but uh, no, it was a great play. Too bad they, they didn't go all the way. But no, it's what it is. A <laughs> Sebastian, last one. So if I came and visited you in Nashville and we went to a, a karaoke bar on the strip, what would what what would your song be? Country song. Oh my God. What's your country song? Uh oh boy. Uh I like every music, uh every kind of every style of music, but uh you know uh back in the day and in, to honor uh to honor uh, him uh, right now would be Toby Keith. Uh, ah. Should have been a cowboy. Should have been there a cowboy. Go. It was pretty yeah. cool. It was pretty cool. So, because when I when I played here back in the day, uh, obviously it came from Montreal. <laughs> There's not a lot of country music in Montreal, so I uh, I've learned I've learned the hard way. I guess it was the guys were playing in lots of countries in the, in, the, in the locker room, and then we we got introduced to a lot of country music stars, and then I bet you're you're soaking in, you know. So you're, you're like, all right. Let's listen some country. So I got to learn a lot of to love country music, and uh, Kobe Keith was uh, Toby Keith was one of the uh, I guess early two thousand late nineties superstar uh, back then. Yeah. Superstar, and uh, yeah, should have been a cowboy. Uh, it was actually a really good song that I liked. <laughs> love it, love it, Sebastian. Listen, man, thanks so much for your time, and uh, best of luck to you and the Predators here down the stretch. And uh, again, thanks for giving Thank back to the community, man. Thank you, guys.